Randall's talk is entitled Apocalypse How New Rules for Writing Code in the New Found, new found Era of Ethical Ambiguity. Everybody give it up for Randall Thomas. All right. So. I guess I will just project. Yes? Oh, oh hey. Could you get a Barry White filter on there for me? <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi, thank you so much for waking up early and actually uh, coming, even though there was both free food and free coffee. Uh, there would be really no reason for me to be giving this talk, especially if it wasn't, well, 9 a.m. and everybody seems to pretty much be awake and, and started. So um, I also want to thank Bruce and everybody else who's put together, like Maggie and Bruce, let's give it for them. They, uh, we wouldn't be here without a lot of the hard work they've put together on this, so thanks. So, who doesn't like starting off nine in the morning with a vision of hope? <laughs> right, because well, you know, it's, it's hard opening a conference. You're supposed to be inspiring people. You're supposed to be telling them, this is why we do this. And... <laughs> If, has anybody actually ever heard one of my other like, talks like this? Great, so all of you have tears and like you have tissues waiting for this, so you know what to expect. So um, I would go over this slide, except all the embarrassing uh, things that I wrote to get into this conference are were just read, so we don't need to cover this um, or that. But I do want to talk about this. Seeing as this is a small, intimate room, we're going to make this interactive. That means that we are all going to be talking in shout out questions and there are parts I'm gonna call on you. So it'll be like a Socratic method class, right? So don't be a little terrified if I go you, right? So we're gonna start this morning with a little creative visualization and an exercise, right? So how, much, how many people here have actually worked in startups or are in a startup or have tried to build one? Okay, a lot of us. How many people have ever gone through the personal agony of talking with venture capitalists about what you're trying to do, right? So you're trying to explain somebody with an MBA that thinks calculus is a, a triangle and the area under the triangle is one half base times height. Very complex ideas. It doesn't work, but it's super important because these people have more influence upon your world than you would think. So we are gonna today take the role of venture capitalists for the opening of our talk. We have all been granted millions of shill coins. Now, shill coin is very special. Shill coin can only be used to invest in startups that's on the shill chain, right? <laughs> you as an investor are going to see several startups and you're going to actually have to pick which one you wish to invest in. So the first pitch comes from a group called Liar, right? Liar has an advanced AI that can otherwise create images from nothing, whole cloth. Why try and argue with the facts you have when you can get the facts and the images you want? Right? So I get it. A lot of you are going to want to invest your shill coin in this right now, but hold on to it. In at least another 30 seconds, the value of the shill coin is probably going to go up, or it might go to zero, but that's not the point. We have more startups. Elector. You know, I don't know if you guys have heard anything about democracy, but it's not what it once was. And I really think democracy could use uh, VCs, progressive influence to monetize and otherwise make efficiencies in marketing for a democracy, right? And at Elector, well, I'll tell you right now, we designed an AI that can absolutely get you the votes you need when you need them. For the low, low price of the lifetime value, LTV, lifetime value of vote, right? We basically ensured that our AI can take any democracy anywhere and convert it to the exact shape that's most efficient for your market idea. So, how many people want to put their shill coin here? Or do you need more choices? More choices? I know, I know, <laughs> like I'm thinking, like, come on, democracy, right? <laughs> See, this one's my bet, but I've spent a lot of time in Florida, so I know all about for-profit prisons. And so, convictor. At Convictor, we don't really care so much about guilt or innocence as much as we care about the evidence that makes the legal process efficient. I mean, we've all heard about the sort of the, 
what is it, nine months to get a jury trial, three years sometimes in jail, and you haven't been even been convicted of anything? Convictor, we can get you the evidence to speed up those trials. Now, sure, our AI manufactures some of it, but that's not really the point. We can make it more efficient, and we can capture that value and return it to our shareholders. And as a shareholder of a shill coin, that's you. All right? And then our final one, Tormentor. One of my personal favorites. Tormentor, we actually identify the recently bereaved. We actually take videos and audio of their loved ones and use an AI to otherwise create deep fakes for them and call them incessantly saying, why did you go cheap on the headstone? Now, of course, anybody with a credit card or a credit rating above 650 can press one during these robocalls to stop those calls from coming for the next month. Now, if you subscribe to our ultimate tormentor service, we can guarantee that you and at least three loved ones that you choose will not get one of these robocalls or a deep fake from a post saying, why did you leave me in the ground? We think that we can extend the bereavement process to almost eternity, ensuring that these people are basically in our pocket forever, returning infinite value to shill coin and increasing the value of shill chain. So, all right, Shark Tank style. Which one do we want to fund? Anybody, who wants to destroy democracy? Okay, yeah. We got some dictators in the world. Anybody who wants to actually have deep fakes terrorizing the bereaved? <laughs> There's good profit in that. <laughs> Convictor? Oh, gosh, of course, like to like to say two of this. I, I, I get it. You could say, of, of course, the black guy at the front of the room wants to take over the police. It's a thing. <laughs> there are going to be more jokes like this throughout the conversation. It's okay. It's okay. Right? Uh, so, but here's the funny thing about all this stuff, right? A as much as we sort of make a, a humorous presentation about the nature uh, of these types of concepts, there's a Black Mirror-esque aspect to what we're talking about here, right? Who's here of Cambridge Analytica? <laughs> all of us should have, comrade. <laughs> it's, it's, it's common. Cambridge Analytica has offered much help to my country in time of need. Right, like <laughs> $725 million for a privacy settlement because they sold a bunch of information to people so that they can influence an election. Now, as to whether or not it actually worked, most of the, the analysis has shown that it didn't really have a net impact directly. But what it did do is allow people to, just asking questions here, was it really an election? Was it really fair? And calling into doubt the process of a democracy is actually how you undermine and destroy it. Audio deepfakes are real. They've been producing audio deepfakes from information of loved ones and saying things like, I'm in jail right now. You need to wire this money to a bail bondsman. I'm so scared. Or I'm in the hospital. And the people have been doing it because if grandma called you up and said, I'm in the hospital, but they're not going to treat me unless you send me some money, how many of us are going to be like, okay, grandma, what's your birthday? <laughs> what's the name of my cat? How big was the check you sent me last year for my birthday? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, it was a money order. Right? But this is, this is a thing. Uh, how many people have heard of Clearview AI? They're kind of a favorite foil of mine. Clearview AI, they're a company that basically violated the terms of service of almost every social media platform in existence and said, go ahead, sue us. Took your information, took your personal data and, and facial uh, information, and then put it into a biometric database and then started selling it to everybody from police forces to authoritarian governments. Um, there's an entirely different thing that you can go look and research about, but we've already shown that facial recognition is terrible for pretty much three groups. Anybody who's an indigenous person, black people, and women, right? There's, um, there's another thing you can look up called the Algorithmic Justice League that has identified and done scholarly research about exactly how high the error rates are, especially ironically for women. As it turns out, a bunch of bros who play ultimate frisbee aren't really good at building <laughs> algorithms to detect things about women, right? Um, because the entire data set had nothing but the dudes who were, hey, how many pictures do you have? 20, how about you? 15, it's just our ultimate frisbee team, right? Yeah, all right, that's good enough. It's a training set, it'll work, right? But think about this. This guy spent six days in jail because 
a piece of software misidentified him. He got out. How many people didn't? Or how many people have been forced into a deadly encounter because the, the AI said, oh, he's wanted on six felonies, violent homicides? Oh, yeah, bro. Load up. Regulators? Anyway. Right? And um, are we all aware about the writer's strike that's going on right now? Uh, if you're not, you will be as your TV descends once again into the real world 17. Um, there's a thing right now where we actually already have so many AIs. It seems like there's an every other day there's another AI that's coming out that's specifically targeting these types of things. And it's, uh, by the way, Waifu Labs is a real thing. I totally thought that was BS. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about it. You want to know, Google it. I would suggest a VPN. <laughs> so we've all heard this, this statement. The future is here. It's not evenly distributed. Well, um, I think it's even becoming less evenly distributed than we would have thought. So. So here's the entirety of this talk, because I've had your attention for 20 minutes, and it might be that the coffee is wearing off by now. So you can leave after this. It's a quote. And I know you're not supposed to have lots of words on slides, but I think this one is worth your time. All else being equal, not many people would prefer to destroy the world. First off, the keys here are not many, <laughs> right? But wait, this is a Randall talk. There's more. If our extinction event proceeds slowly enough to allow a moment of horrified realization, the doers of the deed will likely be quite taken aback on realizing that they have actually destroyed the world. Therefore, I suggest that if the Earth is destroyed, it will probably be by mistake. So you can see the footnotes for this, and I actually have it, and I'll talk about the, um, the MRI, the Machine Research Institute, and some of this research. But it's, this is actually from a scholarly paper on cognitive biases and how people assess what's called global existential catastrophic risk. In other words, the odds that the world will end. There are people who study this, and I don't know how you get into this, but I'd love to go to one of their conferences and be a fly on the wall. So to put it in another way, would you like to play a game? Not necessarily coming on your PlayStation 5, but this is a thing, right? What we're talking about is existential catastrophic risk. And the question is, well, hey man, I just signed up for an Alexa conference. What are you talking about? So let me walk you through it. 10 things wrong with tech. So, everybody know what one of these things are? Air tags, right? I love mine. I could not find my keys without them. Um, this is actually an article from 2021 uh, that was from Fast Company, where they talk about air tags, privacy, and stalker proof. Now, full disclosure, at some point in time, I did work for the fruit stand. So, this is not dinging them particularly, right? Um, they're great and positive uses for air tags, right? Did anybody remember the Southwest like travel apocalypse where the dude who like Lufthansa said, your bag is with you and he's like, no, I can tell you exactly where it is and he started sending them screenshots and tweeting like pictures of his bag. So air tags are cool, right? They've, they've got a lot of great uses. There are a thousand and one uses for an air tag, right? Now, this isn't calling out Apple specifically. What it is talking about is that at one point in time, it was much harder to get a GPS tracker and work with it. You had to go to some special sketchy spy shop in the bad part of town or call Sharper Image and then pay $500 and then get a nine volt battery because <laughs> does anybody even know what a nine volt battery looks like? <laughs> yeah. anybody, anybody that doesn't have either, <laughs> I was about to say hair that looks like mine and I forgot I don't have any anymore. But my point is like, the whole point of this is that technology, all of it, is dual use. Have you heard about dual use technology? These are the things that we can't export to places like Iran. And increasingly, everything we build as tool builders in a digital world 
are dual use technologies. If anybody's ever seen Old Boy, there are a thousand and one uses for a claw hammer. There's a great fight scene, it's predicated on a claw hammer, trust me. Just find it on YouTube and you'll exactly look at it, you'll never look at a hammer the same way in your life, right? Probably one of the most famous sort of critiques of dual use technology came from this gentleman here. Do I need to tell anybody what he invented along with a guy named Oppenheimer? Uh, you know, he wrote the letter that was influential in m ensuring that the United States did the research for the Manhattan Project. And then later on, after seeing the devastation of the first two devices used on people, he spent the rest of his life advocating for peace. Right? It's just some math. It's a couple equations. Most of us know the basic one. So it's dual use technology, right? So consequences. Um, is anybody here sitting there saying, hey, I thought you said there were 10 things? Yeah, then you missed the nerd joke. Space two. <laughs> so let's think about some of the consequences for these, these types of tools that we're all rapidly rushing towards as we move fast and break things. Right? Now, depending on who you look at um, and with the research, the unemployment during the Great Depression in the United States goes anywhere from a low of around 55 or 6% to as high as 20%. Like, it depends on how you measure effective unemployment, actual unemployment, occasional employment, the whole point thing. <laughs> They're talking about impacting 300 million plus jobs. Right? Have you ever seen boarding when they announce on a plane what happens when they're like, we have three seats left and there are 20 people on a standby list? What do you think is gonna happen when you say we have three jobs left and there are 3,000 people in front of the Walmart? Right, it doesn't take that much to put a massive strain on a social fabric. But these tools are coming. Chat GPT and the Chat GPT wars have already started up and they're going to have casualties, right? and that could be somebody's livelihood. Probably not in this room, except, I don't know, co-pilot does seem to be coming for our jobs, right? How about the carbon footprint of this stuff? Now, this came from a MIT Technology Review article, I think about 2019. In 2019, training an AI model was about 65,000 pounds of carbon. That's about the annual use of a family car five times over for one model. Generally speaking, when you start training these models, you will do multiple trainings, multiple retrainings, and multiple, you basically over time, the models will drift, you'll check them. So every time somebody's like, hey man, you gonna retrain that model? Yeah, imagine five Hondas running around the world for a year. So what's the cost to the environment for, I don't know, my GPT-7, you know, 20 years of, of large language models trained right here. <coughs> Don't mind the ozone alert, right? There's a real effect for this. And disproportionately, remember, this is going to be probably in a place where we're already deforesting or stealing their natural resources. Eventually it'll catch up with us, but not right now. Um, I just threw this one in here. It's not AI related because talk finally kind of sounds like AI is coming for our lives and our jobs is going to murder us like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But um, ransomware. Ransomware routinely targets hospitals because they have some of the most outdated and outmoded IT systems. And one of the funny things that, uh, about this, I don't know if you guys, you guys heard about this one. A ransomware group locked out a children's hospital and even other ransomware groups are like, brah. <laughs> like, really? They sent them a free decryptor. But other hospitals have had to do things like cancel surgeries, elective and non-elective, because they can't run the operating theater. They don't have the IT support to get blood, blood products to where they're going. They can't basically say, did the autoclave run? I don't know, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Where's the Excel spreadsheet? Behind this crypto locker thing, right? So that software ultimately has probably cost lives. 
maybe that, that inoperable tumor didn't get excised soon enough that it didn't metastasize or something like that. I don't know. But this is software directly affecting whether or not people get health care. And you can buy it for like $500 off of a tour site somewhere. So one of the things I want to talk about is, is the effect on us as developers of these tools. There's a concept of something called moral injury. And they're starting to research it. A lot of the research first came from nurses working in critical care and basically exceeding the, the stress of making life and death decisions on a regular basis. And they've actually found it's, an, it's a critical part of soldiers experiencing PTSD and other individuals. And it comes down to a couple of different things. But it's mostly when you have a moral or ethical code and what you're forced to do violates it. It actually creates an imprint on your psyche. And repeated injuries and insults to that moral code result in trauma that we have to process. So I don't know who wrote some BitLocker code. I'm sure it's somebody who actually thought of it as a job. But if I could show them the three people that died and the families that were crying because their grandmother didn't get the surgery they needed or an open heart surgery didn't happen or an organ went unused, would that impact them? I don't know. Right? So let's talk about solutions, right? Like, oh, God, Randall's just throwing out problems. It's 9 a.m. It's 9.30. He's basically, you start wanting to start putting whiskey in your coffee already. I recommend Oban or Balvenie, actually. <laughs> Self-regulation. This is the thing, right? <laughs> hey, hey, guys. This is tech. You don't know anything about it. We can take care of this. Stand back. I've got this, right? Self-regulation. So let's, let's take a look at could this be a thing. Who knows Google's original motto? Don't be evil, right? Yeah, exactly. Don't be evil. I think that's a great motto. I, I mean, is there not a lot of wiggle room there? Or you can be like, okay, hey, don't be evil. Except in 2015, they changed it. <laughs> Do the right thing. Spike Lee joint. Now, um, <laughs> do the right thing. That's very different than don't be evil. Like, <laughs> okay, uh, imagine this. It's like, uh, imagine somebody's like, hey, um, you're going on a Tinder date, and the person says, what's your ethos? Don't be evil. And then like three drinks in, it's like, hey, where'd you get that don't be evil thing? Oh, that's not my ethos anymore. What's your ethos? Do the right thing. <laughs> well, let's see if we can do the right thing. Tim McGurbu was a researcher that are basically said that they were ousted from Google for pointing out, maybe there's some concerns with these large language models that we should address before we start making them available to everybody, right? You can go Google it. You can find out about this. This controversy was fought on Twitter. A bunch of people actually put up her paper for peer review. Her paper was pulled because it said it didn't meet the scholarly level. I don't know if it does or not. MIT Technology Review seems to think that it was okay. Um, and a bunch of people at Google actually signed papers in support of her research talking about these dangers. And it wasn't she was like saying, hey, don't do it. And she's just like, what are the implications and the moral implications of, the, of doing this? She was forced out of Google. Strangely, I don't, how many people have heard of BARD? Yeah, BARD, great. A large language model released by Google almost two years later after they searched about that. Coincidence? I'm just asking questions here. <laughs> right? So maybe self-regulation isn't the way to go. Fox and the hen house and all that. So. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Government's gonna step in, and I know there's some old enough people who actually remember this. I saw it in a theater. A theater's a place where you actually go, you pay money um, for popcorn, and uh, Coke costs $10. <laughs> anyway, so you're gonna be like, okay, that's, a, that's not a problem. The government will step in. Clearly, <laughs> the government's gotta have this, right? So. Let's examine this, shall we? Who was alive in 2008? I'm old enough, I have to ask this question now. <laughs> Who owned a home in 2008? Who owned one in 2009? <laughs> <laughs> Ay, 
geared, I geared. But we all realized that there was a thing called the subprime lending crisis, blah, 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 lending. So here's what it looks like in pictures, because a picture's worth a thousand words. The, um, this is basically saying that about a quarter of all loans during that crisis and that run-up were considered subprime. Now, just to think of it this way, uh, I don't know, how many people here eat breakfast cereal or, I don't know, cereal, meat, something? We all eat, uh, we all eat things. Okay, a pack of hot dogs. They could be vegan if you want or are better or beyond meat. But a pack of hot dogs. Imagine there are 12 hot dogs, right? Now, what I'm going to tell you is that mm, three to four of those hot dogs in the pack of 12 are rotten. But I'm not going to tell you which three to four. You just have to eat them and find out. Yeah, right? Like, we'd be like, no, no. But we did that with our financial system, right? It resulted in us passing this great thing, the Dodd-Frank Act. It basically said, hey, jackasses, quit that out. Like, stop it. Um, it put stronger regulations about capitalization to make sure that banks could not fail and that they actually otherwise had strong consumer protections. Then a bill called 2155 passed in 2018 uh, strangely named the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. What's that? It really off the yeah, it does. It does roll off the tongue. It has a nice lilt to it. I could say it in an Irish accent if I could. But um, this was a comment from a, uh, a collegiate professor and attorney. Uh, I think it's a tragic mistake. It will significantly increase, blah, blah, blah. You can read the text, but... I'm going to go for the red. We have forgotten all the basic lessons of the causes and consequences of the financial crisis. It basically gutted Dodd and Frank. And everybody's like, hey, we learned our lesson. Everything's going to be fine. Back off, government. So let's skip ahead. Anybody recognize this logo? <laughs> Actually, does anybody in the room had, did anybody in the room like wake up with money in SVB? Because I know we have a lot of startups. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We don't have to shamefacedly do it, guys. <laughs> like, it's okay. It wasn't your fault. Um, yeah, remember Silicon Valley Bank? Bank run, collapse, most startups. For a while, we thought the entire startup section had to be bought in another bailout. It's not a bailout, right? We're just passing the cost on to the people who are depositors. Wait, aren't I a depositor? So I'm paying for my own bailout? How does that work? Anyway, so it's a one-off, right? I know what you're saying. <laughs> now, one of my favorite movies about this is there's a movie called The Smartest Guys in the Room. If you've never seen it, it's worth watching. It talks specifically about the Enron debacle. Like, uh, this is a Bruce conference, so I'm not going to swear, but uh, duckery is the only way that I can, can, can describe it. Epic duckery, right? And if we think, like I said, it's a one-off. So it's a two-off, you know, because off by one errors, standard programmer problem. Except uh, UBS, one of the largest banks in the world, was fined a bunch of money for fixing the overnight bank lending rate to make more money. <laughs> this was all within the regulatory framework of government oversight, mind you. And at the end of it, the best they could do is be like, hey, uh, give us a billion bucks. And they're like, sure. What I want to know is how much did they make from fixing the LIBOR rate, that giving a billion bucks was actually okay? <laughs> what are they asking for? If they want a billion, give them 1.5. <laughs> right? And they weren't the only one. So I'm going to go with regulation is probably not going to be our answer. Right? So I think it's because one of the things we have to be aware of, there's a concept of something called moral hazard obligatory text definition, but the short version comes down to this. Um, did you, does anybody, my, my dad used to have dadisms, right? He's a military career military guy, and um, he's always like, hey, don't write checks, your butt can't cash, boy. I know, it's black Johnny Cash, but that's kind of how my dad <laughs> sounded. Um, but there's a thing, right? Insurance is a deal. In every one of these instances, they didn't have to pay for it. Like the people at Silicon Valley Bank, if I remember correctly, were selling shares in the bank like up between the months before the bank collapsed. And strangely, they're like, I didn't know it was going to collapse. Okay, pass the sniff test, maybe. 
But moral hazard is basically whenever you get the profit, but you don't have to pay for the, the downside. There's no risk assigned to you, right? When the housing market collapsed, those guys didn't lose their mansions in Westchester. They got to keep the yachts. People like you and me lost our houses, and people who are farther down the economic ladder never got a chance to have one, right? And then there are a whole bunch of things called real, real estate investment trusts that bought up all the houses, but that's a completely different talk. Short version is, there's got to be a better way than this for otherwise organizing and keeping the tools that we're building at a very rapid clip from having an adverse impact on everyone. Because the things that you're doing, the tools that you're building, whether it's NX, whether it's LiveView, these applications, whether it's just a mortgage application, they're not just affecting the future of yourself, they're affecting the future of everyone more and more, right? So, this is the point in time in a traditional talk of mine where we all realize that Randall has said we're screwed. I'm not sure. Anybody know who this guy is? Other than a blank-eyed zombie, a white walker? Who? It's close. It's hip. It's a Seneca. Actually, you know what? I never thought about that. It could be. You're right. It's generic Greek white dude, right? <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> This is a trick question. It, it, it's Hippocrates, and the only reason I know is actually because Wikimedia is like, it could have been Plato. I think I'm gonna, in the next version of this talk, I'm going to actually be like, ha-ha, you're right, it's not Hippocrates, this is Hippocrates. Anyway, um, the source of the Hippocratic Oath, right? We all generally know what it says. Actually, as it turns out, in doing some research about this, the old one's really cool because it says you will not treat with pagan gods and a bunch of other things. But there is an updated version of it that they give in modern medical hospitals, and this is one of the key tenets at the end, right? I will remember that I am a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body as well as the infirm, right? And I'm not sure, but I'm starting to wonder as we mature, as software developers, as engineers, is it time for us to recognize that it's not just harmless fun, that move fast and break things has real repercussions that ooze out into the real world, and that we need to basically ask more questions about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and for whom we are doing these things, right? That fact that we can cause real harm on a scale that is unprecedented, which generally speaking has only been able to have been done by weapons of mass destruction previously, right? Clearview AI, I'm not just picking on them for a little bit, but they have the ability to affect tens or hundreds of thousands of lives. Somebody might not get a job because their facial recognition says this guy is a felon. A database of registered sex offenders with an error could ruin someone's life. Sentencing recommendations are routinely done and reviewed by software. So I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I do know that not thinking about it is no longer an option for us. Not if we actually uh, want to have a, a society that's both fair and just, one that actually works for more than just the few who have the access to capital. And that's now not only increasing money, but also knowledge, right? Access to technology. And as the people in this room who are at the forefront of discovering what those tools are like, realistically, if you're at a conference, you're self-selecting to a group who truly believes that we have a responsibility to self-improve, that you wanna learn what's going to come next. Like, trust me, 10 years from now, there's gonna be an enterprise elixir, like, I don't know, runtime, people are gonna be like, yeah, I've been doing enterprise class elixir for about the last six years. Like, there's gonna be WebSphere elixir version or something, I don't know. So, would you like to know more? There's a fascism joke here. This is actually, I don't know where Chris is, but. Oh, yeah, hey. <laughs> yes. Set spike. I'm doing my part, too. Um, this is the Marine Intelligence, uh, excuse me, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. It, the, the title is too long, um, but cognitive biases potentially affecting judgment of global risks. 
reads like a smorgasbord of how your brain cannot actually calculate any of the risks. And it's well studied. It's based in a lot of the work, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, if anybody's ever read Kahneman and Tversky or any of those books about cognitive bias, specifically it addresses cognitive bias when the actual outsized value of the, the, the event is unknown or unknowable. And it talks about all the ways your brain tricks you into thinking that you can understand what's going on. Highly recommend it, but have something strong to drink while you're reading it because you're gonna be like, we're doomed. We're doomed. This is another one. Um, it's an extension of that same work, but uh, it's the fact that, strangely enough, uh, the researcher, he, um, Yudowski, he originally came around saying that nanotechnology and biotechnology is probably the biggest risk to humanity. Things like CRISPR were very large at the time. Remember gene editing, designer babies, all that stuff? And then he's like, he's like, AI will be fine. It's probably gonna be great. And as he looked into it and he did more research, he's like, oh God, it's not gonna be fine. And it ended up with his own paper specifically talking about the risks of artificial intelligence. Worth a read. And in fact, it's, it's so worth a read that I have a pull quote for you, right? This sums up all the research in that paper. By far the greatest danger of artificial intelligence is that people conclude truly really that they understand it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Black Swan. Um, this is part of a series of books by a guy who, uh, it's called the Incerto? In in anyway, but short version, this is a worth a read for anybody who wants to talk about risks because in his thesis is that the world isn't defined by normal distributions, that nice standard curve, it's defined by heavily tailed distributions. So in other words, the black death doesn't have to happen that many times to make an impact on the world, right? And nobody could have seen the black death coming. So black swans are things that in retrospect, of course it was going to happen, right? But at the time, nobody saw it coming. And if you think about this, there are lots of things like this, from the invasion of Ukraine to the outbreak of World War I. Um, it's a good read for understanding why assigning import to these events that are very rarely happen is such a critical thought for us, especially when you talk about the leveraging automation and software, which is one of the things that we do, right? Um, Countdown to Zero Day is a great book. How many people have ever heard of Stuxnet? Right? Worth reading because it literally gives you the blueprint for what cyber weapons and actual software weapons are going to look like. It's the first time that instead of bombing something into oblivion, a bunch of guys wrote code to remove a threat to national security. It's really important because there are lots of components in there. Not everybody was a witting participant in understanding what they were doing and the role they played. You know? And then just for something fun, um, Rogue Trader. <laughs> this is about a guy who basically brought down one of the oldest banks in Britain because of his trading strategies. And it talks about the fragility in trading systems and the financial systems, which underpin almost everything that we do, right? We all need money at some level. So, so what's the takeaway here? I'm not sure that I have all the answers or any answers for any of us in this room. But what I do know is that we are the people who get to make an active and participatory choice in the types of tools we make, the people that we give them to, and the labor, the intellectual labor that we provide. It's not zero impact. It's not, eh, just for fun. It's not move fast and break things. Because oftentimes the effect will be felt far away from us, far away from our jobs. But that doesn't mean that it actually doesn't eventually impact us. If we're gonna live in a connected world, we should have a responsibility for the impact we have on that connecting. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for your, both your time and attention. I know it's super early, and thank you for, for, for caring enough to come to a conference and actually sort of commune with your fellow nerds and geeks and think about some of the aspects of, of what we do. Um, and by all means, if you want some of the other slides or the references, usually I, I do a PDF of all the links, send me an email, and then I'll forward that out to you. So, thank you so much. Yeah.